I'm here with Bill Haggerty, who is running for U.S. Senate uh, here in Tennessee, and he's running on the Republican ticket. First off, Bill, just tell us a little bit about yourself. Reed, it's nice to be with you and your listeners today, uh, and it's great to be here in Tennessee. I'm a fourth-generation Tennessean from Sumner County, Tennessee. Uh, we had a small farm there, um, grew up raising cattle and pigs. I think I grew up like uh, many Tennesseans. Um, my parents were hardworking. They taught us to love Christ. They taught us to love our country. And they taught us to love one another. I learned the value of hard work as a kid. As I mentioned, um, you know, working, you know, wor- working on the farm was a big part of that. Uh, when I got older, I worked my way through school on the road crew. My father uh, worked road construction just like his father did. Um, in fact, I was the first Haggerty to graduate from college, working my way through school, uh, working road construction, and had a full-time job during school. But uh, very blessed to have had a chance to graduate from college. Uh, that gave me a foundation to go and have a successful career in business, frankly, a career I could have never imagined as a young kid growing up uh, in Sumner County. And the backbone of my, of my life has been, you know, as a business person, somebody that's risked his own capital, somebody that's met a payroll, employed people, delivered results. I've had the great opportunity to come back and serve the people of Tennessee uh, when we changed from a Democrat to a Republican administration back in January of 2011. I was asked to come in and run economic development for the state of Tennessee. I joined the governor's cabinet, came in at a time when Tennessee's unemployment rate was below the national average. We were in the bottom half of all the states. This is when we were trying to turn out of the last uh, economic downturn. That recovery was the slowest on record. When I came in, Tennessee also had a massive budget deficit, over a billion dollars. And so given my business background, I went first took a hard look at my department, and it took us about 30 days to figure it out. On day 45, we implemented a new structure, eliminated over 40% of the positions in the department. That saved millions of dollars for Tennessee taxpayers, and that gave me a chance to restructure the department and put the staff out in the field near the companies, near the local leaders, where I felt they needed to be to really work to grow the economy. And over the next four years that I did that job, Tennessee took off. By the time I left, Tennessee had become the number one state in the nation for creating jobs through foreign investment, and we were named the state of the year for economic development two years in a row. So indeed, taking conservative physical uh, policies and practices and put them into play, uh, you can do more with less. We were able to do it here at the state level. We need more of that in Washington. Went back to my uh, private sector life. Again, business person. I've served on the boards of New York Stock Exchange traded companies, NASDAQ companies, a lot of privately held companies. And in 2016, uh, during that presidential race, I heard a candidate talk like I'd never heard another candidate talk. We've had both Republicans and Democrats look the other way when it comes to China. I've been concerned about China for years. And finally, in candidate Trump, we had someone who said he was willing to stand up to China. I remember talking with my wife. The odds were not high that Trump could win. But I decided to go in and and dedicate six months full-time of my life to help him win that race. And no, against the odds, Reed, we won. And I went in, went in to help during the transition. My job was to help uh, President-elect Trump put together the cabinet. I didn't pick the cabinet, but I put the choices together and worked with him uh, to get the cabinet in place. So I've got a great working relationship with most everyone in the cabinet today. And then uh, when it came down to what I could best do to represent America and carry the ball forward, President Trump asked me to become the U.S. ambassador to Japan. Part of my business career, I'd lived in Japan several decades before. I'd learned the language, I'd learned the culture, and I'd learned the business community there. So it was a logical fit. Uh, We also were facing some pretty big challenges then. And Japan is the cornerstone of where we deal with all of the threats in East Asia. Think about it. You've got North Korea, Russia, and China right there. Japan has more military station there on that island, more U.S. military station there than any other place in the world, just to deal with those threats. So... President Trump sent me there. Japan's the third largest economy in the world after the United States and Russia. I'm sorry, China. And that's where I went to work, particularly standing up to China militarily, making certain that our military assets were properly stationed and well-resourced. We had a big pivot toward Asia, this time a real pivot. You know, before, uh, my predecessor was uh, in the previous administration leading from behind. Uh, Japanese, the people in the region, didn't know what that meant, uh, leading from behind was a very ineffective strategy. Their strategy toward North Korea, they called strategic patience, which if you're a parent, you know what that means. It just means looking the other way. That's when the North Koreans ramped up their North Korean 
nuclear program uh, to a level very threatening to the rest of the world. In fact, after I was there, the North Koreans launched two intercontinental ballistic missiles over Japan. Uh, it was a very tense time, and we stood down North Korea very effectively and stood up against China at every turn. President Trump stepped in, put in place uh, a tariff that really brought China to the table, and we got a trade deal done with Japan, one that uh, had taken, you know, many, many administrations prior had not been able to do this. Uh, we got an excellent trade deal done with Japan, and I was very pleased. I worked my heart out two years to get that done. But then the question came, what could I do more? And President Trump talked with me about the open seat here in Tennessee and suggested that someone with my knowledge of China, the threat that that poses, someone that understands trade, business, and the economy is exactly what's needed in the United States Senate. So he encouraged me, he endorsed me, as did several other people to come back and run for this open Senate seat. Chrissy and I have four kids. Uh, we love them dearly. As we thought about them, we thought about the challenges we see coming out of Washington. But we're coming back to stand up to a major push towards socialism. We don't think that the people of Tennessee want this nation to turn socialist any more than it has. I'm coming back to stand up for your children and grandchildren and for my children so that they have the kind of opportunity, the kind of freedom that I was so fortunate to have, the type of freedom that would let a small-town kid from Sumner County literally change his stars. So that's why I'm back right now, to stand up for that and to be a strong ally of President Trump and this administration as we continue to push for free market answers. We continue to push to get the economy open. We continue to push for law and order, things that Tennesseans care about a great deal. Now, you talked about it a little bit just now, but is there anything else you'd like to say about why you're running for U.S. Senate? The, the needs in the Senate, I think, are great. We need folks there that have solid business background, business DNA, that understand the economic consequences of uh, the, the legislation that's moving through. We also need people, you know, I was an Eagle Scout, Reed. You need people who are trustworthy, loyal, who have strong character, who can withstand the onslaught, um, you know, the constant uh, efforts of the Democrats to undo, to really push in their own, in their own way to, to grab power. You need people with a solid foundation, a solid character. And having a conservative Christian like me raised with Tennessee values, I think makes all the difference. We want to take solid Tennessee values to the U.S. Senate, not have them come the other way around. And as I go across the state, I certainly get that feedback and, and, and that sort of support, is we need people like you, Bill. Uh, people with deep experience, people with strong character, people whose word we know we can take. So that is, is what I hope to bring to the Senate, bring a level of civility, and really try to get things done. My, my working relationship with the administration is unique. You know, I ran one of the largest embassies in the world. We had, I think, 28 different departments and agencies report to me there. On a daily basis, I was working at the operational level with these, with these uh, organizations back in Washington. So I can pick the phone up and call not only the cabinet secretary, but the people within the agency that can make things happen right away. And I think that uniquely allows me to represent Tennessee and get things done you know, on a, on a first uh, day one basis in a way that will be very helpful. I also have a great working relationship with Senator Marsha Blackburn. Uh, she's doing a great job there and I think the most conservative leader in the Senate. And she and I together will bring a conservative perspective from Tennessee that will make a real difference uh, across the nation. What do you think is the biggest issue the country is currently facing? Well, obviously, the pandemic has put, uh, you know, an incredible, you know, inserted an incredible change into our nation. Um, dealing with the pandemic and getting our economy going again are related, uh, and jobs in the economy are the number one topic that I talk with people about as I go across Tennessee. Before the pandemic hit us, our nation was on a roll economically. We had uh, the best economic growth, the best wage growth, the lowest unemployment rates for every category of person, you know, whether they be minorities, women. Our, co our country was really in a great place. My work in Japan, we'd move, we'd move the Japanese country from being the third best investor in America to becoming number one. We really had a lot of motion, a lot of movement coming our way. And the president's put me on the White House Economic Recovery Task Force to try to help accelerate uh, the recovery of America now to get back on that track. But to do it, we've got to beat this vaccine. I mean, we've got to beat this pandemic. And I'm very optimistic about where, where we are with the vaccines. The president has put in place a fast-track program. It's called Operation Warp Speed. There are approximately 100 vaccine candidates in Operation Warp Speed right now. Three of them 
are in phase three human trials. We're very optimistic about those. They're now being tested in humans, and they've already begun to ramp up production so that when the FDA approves one of them and when the large companies, you know, Johnson & Johnson, you know, that size company, when they're real ready to put their stamp of approval on those vaccines, we will be ready to ship and distribute them. I had a great conversation with Fred Smith at uh, FedEx just the other day, and they're building up all of the capability to get these vaccines distributed. There'll be a protocol. Those that are most vulnerable will get them first. First-line responders will get them. But eventually, uh, I think we're going to be in a position to put this pandemic in the rearview mirror. And that leaves us with the last thing that people are concerned about and talk with me about to get our country back in order. And that is dealing with the violence, the chaos, and the looting that's going on in the streets. What we need to do is put people back to work. We need to make people feel safe about their health. And we need to bring law and order back to our streets. Uh, the, the rioting, this, this, um, you know, this effort of anarchy that's going on has got to come to an end. President Trump has been very clear about it. Uh, it's amazing how politicized it seems to have become. But I think that Americans clearly want to see law and order come back. And as I talk with law enforcement officers across this state, I let them know I've got their back 120 percent. You know, I think America was united in wanting to see real reform, training, um, you know, stepping in and hand, holding police officers accountability when things go wrong. That was certainly the case after the George Floyd tragedy. But what we've seen are anarchists come in and hijack that and really push us in a direction again uh, towards socialism. These are Marxist organizations that are in here now creating havoc and chaos. Uh, we've got to stand up to them, call them what they are, and come back to a nation of law and order. But those things uh, solved and moving in the right direction. I'm optimistic that our economy will take off again. We will see more good jobs. I think Tennessee is particularly well positioned to take off there. And I'm really, you know, really pleased with the focus that Governor Lee has brought about to occupational and vocational training. That will help greatly for our more rural areas and some of our most urban areas, the type of occupational and vocational training that will make our workforce a real competitive advantage as we continue to reshore these companies that other times you know, might have moved to China. We want to get those companies back. It makes us strategically vulnerable. And frankly, with a well-trained workforce, we're going to have a real competitive advantage, and I think Tennessee can be right at the forefront of that. I look forward to getting it going. Speaking of Tennessee, what do you think is the biggest issue facing this state? Tennessee's got a tremendous amount of advantages. We've had strong conservative leadership from our legislatures. Uh, Tennessee has the strongest balance sheet in the nation, meaning we pay for uh, what we build here. You know, some of these states are bankrupt, essentially. There's a lot of debate in Washington right now. That's why some of these, um, some of these bailout packages that Nancy Pelosi is producing are so high. They're trying to get states like Tennessee that have run conservatively to bail out states that have not, like Illinois, North Carolina, you know, um, New Jersey, New York. That's not going to happen. Tennessee has got one of the best logistics infrastructures in the nation. We are well located. Uh, we've got a great business climate. We've got uh, low tax laws, many things that make our state very, very attractive. But there's more we can do. From the infrastructure standpoint, we should continue to build on our infrastructure advantage, traditional infrastructure, highways, roads, bridges. But we also need to take a very hard look at broadband. That's an area where I think we can reach many, many more people. It will help us from an education standpoint. It will also help us from the, the standpoint of being ready for the jobs of tomorrow. Marsha Blackburn and I, I think, will be working very hard on broadband to make certain that we have a, you know, we have a, a great infrastructure there. And again, our education system. Uh, as Governor Lee is moving us, uh, an education system that doesn't require every young person to go to college, but to have great alternatives in the vocational and occupational training areas. These are great jobs, jobs that are in high demand, and we can recruit companies that want people with that sort of training. So I think those challenges are ones that we really can step up and address. And again, a good job solves so many other problems. The other problem that I've, I've been spending a lot of time on is the problem of opioid addiction. And that's taken place, I think it began during the last recession. People got 99 weeks of unemployment. Uh, they were off. A lot of folks uh, then moved to disability. And as folks uh, get on disability, they are, are encouraged to uh, you know, prove and underscore what their, what their disability is. And if pain is part of that problem, um, that, that enables a disability. Look, I've got a lot of pain. I grew up, um, as I mentioned, you know, bailing hay, shoveling asphalt. I bet I could qualify for a disability uh, just with a couple of di busted discs in my back. But it's not good 
to uh, to step onto the, the, the path of, of opioid addiction. I think we've made some real progress in terms of changing the rules in terms of the number of opiates that are that are prescribed, but we've now seen people shifting more toward heroin, methamphetamine, other drugs that are in great concern. And as I talk with law enforcement officers, they tell me that we've got to secure our border in the south. We've got to get that southern border between the U.S. and Mexico secured because that's where these illicit drugs are coming from. They're moving up into Tennessee and they're killing our kids. So we've got to secure our border. We've got to support law enforcement and what they do. And we've got to have more and better treating pro- treatment programs to help those folks that are already trapped. But I want to see the increase in that uh, come to a halt and try to help the people that have been caught in, in that downspin of addiction. And my hope is that, that soon we'll be able to work through this and get those people to a much better place. And what are your plans if you are elected? Well, my, my first goal is to build a really strong team to make certain that we are listening to the needs of Tennesseans and that we are responding to those needs every day. I want to be a strong voice for Tennessee and the United States Senate, making certain that our concerns and our needs are being met and addressed every day. I look forward to partnering strongly with Marsha Blackburn. I think together we'll be a, a, a great team to carry Tennessee's interests forward and make certain that um, the Tennesseans' voices and values are brought forth in the U.S. Congress. I think we can have a real impact. And assuming President Trump holds the White House, I can have an immediate impact with that administration just because of my deep, long, and effective working relationship with them, ways that will help make um, Tennesseans, again, uh, put them in a position to get things done faster and more effectively. That would be my goal, and I'm very optimistic about it. And is there anything else you'd like to say before we go? Just say this. Uh, It's been a blessing for me for now more than a year to travel the state campaigning and meeting Tennesseans um, uh, of all types, talking with faith leaders, talking with business people, talking with with folks that have some very serious problems. And it really has brought uh, brought me to a point to appreciate the calling of the challenge that's been put in front of me. Um, God plays a big role in my life. Um, I pray for the strength and the courage and the wisdom to achieve in a way that will help the people of Tennessee. And I feel so blessed to have had their input to continue to build their friendship. And I want to keep that sort of connection going because it's only with the help of the people of Tennessee that I will be not just a good senator, I want to be a great one. And I'll be that way with the help of the people of Tennessee with their input and their guidance. That was Bill Haggerty. He is running for U.S. Senate on the Republican ticket.